The following interview was conducted with Professor Joseph Haber, Professor Emeritus of Political Science for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, July the 13th, 2009 in Stewart Center, the interview is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Professor Haber. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your early years and your parents. Uh, I was born in, uh, in a small town in southern Germany called Fillingen, which is in Baden. Uh, and uh, in 19, let's see, January the 31st, 1929, that is just shortly before the Depression. And uh, I don't actually remember uh, really that much about my early years. I, I do remember that my father had a job with the finance office, a, a local, sort of a clerical job, very unusual for Jews to be employed in government, uh, even at that time, because there was still a lot of... Uh, Discrimina some discrimination. Anyway, when 1930, uh, I was born also prematurely, which I don't know whether that would explain my odd behavior but at times, but um, when the Depression came, so I don't remember very much about my early years early. In do, fact, you have any, do you have any siblings, any brothers? No, something? except for a, a, a foster brother of sorts who came in when I was about, uh, let's say, 19, probably 1935. I, I'm not exactly sure, but he came when he was three years old and stayed with my parents for about six years, and then he was deported with them to uh, to uh, Camp de Gers in, in Vichy, France. Uh, so I was pretty much by myself. I don't recall any other Jewish children. I do remember uh, going to school there to the Volksschule, which is the kind of a elementary school, uh, which uh, for me was an, uh, an, a really unpleasant experience for the most part because uh, by 19, when I was six, which would be 1935 or so, I guess, um, obviously the, 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 Nas the National Socialists had been in power already for uh, two or three years, and there had already been a lot of indoctrination and, and anti-Semitic laws, so there was a lot of bullying going on and stone throwing, well, a fair, at least that I remember, stone throwing, bullying, name calling and stuff and I was the only Jewish child in the school as far as I remember. And it was probably a small school, not very large. Well, I went to the school recently. It's okay. you know, it was you know, seven hundred okay. children probably in there. Okay. Um, I went I went there, you know, about two months ago. And um, so uh, that was the the the, uh, the child, uh, that was the unpleasant part. In my neighborhood, however, I don't recall, I don't think there was any of that going on. So the, the, kid, the children in the neighborhood were friendly enough and I played with them and I was a very active child. Even though I was prematurely born, I was quite active. My father was a sick man to begin with, very nervous and sick, so we always had to be very careful around him. And of course my parents had a lot on their minds. He was un unemployed, had no other means. My mother was a seamstress, or at least she knew how to do it. So we were poor, but never, never so poor that I went hungry or anything. Right. So it was a very, it was not a warm, emotional kind of environment. And then came 1938, to make a long story short, when uh, after what is misnamed Kristallnacht, which is really, you know, night of the glass where all the synagogues were vandalized or most of them burnt down, uh, the, it's really the Reichspogromnacht, which the Germans, what the Germans call it. Uh, it was a pogrom. Uh, many, uh, quite, a number, uh, quite a number of Jews were killed. Uh, many of the adult males were sent to concentration camps. Uh, a lot of them were sent to concentration camps. Uh, they're over 17. And, I was, uh, and Jewish children were all expelled from German schools. So I do remember this very well, that uh, the day when I stood in class and all the it was very, kids around me were all very excited. Something was going on, and the point of the media, and uh, what it meant was I was out of the school. So my parents had no uh, independent means. They couldn't resettle in a larger town like Frankfurt or Stuttgart or Mannheim, where the Jewish schools were either were in existence or could be set up. And so they undoubtedly their question was, what are we going to do with little Joseph here? So they got in touch with the Jewish agencies, I suppose. Uh, my father, who had connections through, through this, very likely through this boy, they had adopted the news, and they found out about the kinder transport. So I was within three weeks after after this Reichspogromnacht, 
uh, I was on a boat to England uh, with the first children's transport, and that was a that was a really uh, kind of and, and that was really a traumatic experience. Did your parents see you before you left? Well, my father took me. Uh, you had to go to you had to. The boats would leave, in this case the boat left in Holland, so you had to take a train, go to the Dutch border, then you, from the Dutch border, they would take you to the, to the boat. So I remember my father, I remember this, my father coming with me to drop me off at wherever it was, and I knew it was very serious, but I, what did I know about all of it? What did I know it was meant to be a Jew? I mean, it's all to me it was just a big, I wanted to be like them. I wanted to, you know, I, I wanted to have, the, you know, do all the fun things, uh, and so on and so forth. I, I didn't have a clue as to what was really going on. So for me, it was all very uh, shadowing in a way. Uh, so, the, and, and you know how circumstances compound to do things. So I went over there, there's a shock of leaving your parents all of a sudden, there's a shock of going to another place that you don't know about. And you're and very you, young too. Yeah, I'm almost 10, that's right. pretty young. So when I go to England, uh, the, the children were dropped off at a, at, a, at a camp, one of those summer camps where the uh, English go to, you know, to have fun in the summer. Down you have, the, the shore of the beach. And yeah, and you have cabanas and so on and so forth. And they put a, there were a lot of kids now, a couple of hundred in this first boat, so they didn't have enough room to put them all into the facilities, the dormitories or whatever they had on the main part of the camp. So they put me with some other kids in a series of cabanas with a hot water bottle. Hot water bottle was necessary. This was this, this was December the second or third, which was the coldest winter in a hundred years. It was really cold. So the hot, so when I had the hot water bottle and I, get, I was by myself, they didn't put two of us together. I was by myself at the end. Hot water bottle. I got cold, so I put it in the morning with a block of ice. So apparently, when I got up. I had to repress this, but Nina told me. When I got up, I looked around, there was nobody there. You know, I was at the end of all, the, uh, I was, apparently, I, I was by myself. And all of a sudden, I look around, all the children are gone, and here I am. They finally found me, I guess, and. You were at the far end, and they didn't. Yeah, and they didn't, so they, found, they must have taken roll call and said, where's, where's uh, Joseph? Uh, oh, I guess, well, they picked me up. Oh, at the yeah. end. And so th this was not the end of it. So, uh, the, uh, so all right, they got me into they picked me up. I had repressed this. I, I didn't even know that I'd remembered it. And I told it to Nina. I was so, apparently, so traumatic. So then they found out I had a, because of this coldness and whatnot, I'd had a, an infection in my bladder. So they shipped me off to the nearest English hospital. Sensible thing to do. And uh, there in the hospital, the nurses are very nice. There's only one little problem. Um, they didn't speak German, and I didn't speak English. And while I was there, some children's disease broke out in the main camp. Children's, ch uh, whatever it is, uh, children's think? pox or whatever it is, chicken pox. Chicken pox. So they had to go into quarantine. So nobody from that camp, none of the German teachers could come over to the hospital, and nobody from the hospital could not. So here I was, isolated, can't speak any uh, any English. Uh, they, you know, but the nurses were nice. Well, I remember, you know, they did their best. So when I got out, I do remember I was emotionally a real mess. I mean, I remember this walking around in Lowestoft. This was a town, and then I sort of shut down for the next three years. I don't remember virtually very, very, very little. In fact, I remember very little of any of before in Germany. On, uh, so it was very traumatic. And then one day. When I was uh, almost 13, I woke up. I remember. Where I, were you living in England? I, so this was a, when you went there with a the kinder transport, you had two channels. One is you could be adopt, uh, taken in by a family. It was a selection process, you know, but if you were cute, uh, you know, cute. They cute. would select the yes, family. Yes, I wasn't cute apparently, cute enough. So I went into a hostel, which is kind of like an orphanage. And it, it was all, none of this was like Dickens, you know. It wasn't a terrible place. But there were 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 children, boys, you know, this was not a co-educational thing. And so I went to a series of hostels and ended up in a hostel that was, uh, and most of them were, the hostels were sort of religious, you know, they're Jewish, they're religious, they're orthodox, and I had a very orthodox one, uh, so I grew up in an orthodox environment, but 
until I was 13. It's all like a haze. I don't remember. And then I woke up, and then I realized I had problems. I realized I had problems. I, I had enough insight to know, gee, I got problems. So uh, I, initially I thought people were watching me, you know, like paranoia or whatever else. And then I said, I've got to do something to help myself. Because in those days, you didn't have trauma counselors and battalions of counselors who would rush in and say, oh, uh, you were basically on your own. Not that these... Did you go to school? Were you going to yeah, school? Yeah, I was now? going to school, and it took okay. me a while to... I was a very poor student throughout. I went to well, a... Well, you had to learn English. I learned English, all right. Yeah, I did learn English, but I went to a technical high school. There had been a Pennington Technical Institute, which had been evacuated to Northampton because of the Blitz and whatever else, and that's where most of the boys from our hostel went. And these... Um, the hostel boys, the Jewish boys... The refugee boys were ve- most of them were very good students. Really, they excelled. Uh, uh, partly because their, they, you know, their, their parents had emphasized be good and do well and make us proud of you and so on and so forth. So these kids, except for me, <laughs> and maybe one other, they were all excellent students. And these British kids were, you know, the teachers would say, "What's the matter with you? Look at these refugee children and look how smart they are. And why can't you be?" And I thought, well, "What a nice way to make anti-Semites here, <laughs> you know." <laughs> so, so I. Uh, but I was um, uh, very, I was, I don't know how I, uh, for me it was all, I was near the bottom. I, I barely squeaked through. Uh, and, but at the same time, I became, and I, I don't remember a blessed thing about all what I learned about English history and this and that. Yeah, I, it was a complete wiped out. I don't remember any of it. So that tells you something. Uh, and of course the woodwork and the metalwork and whatever else, it, it, I, I was, uh, you know, I really, uh, what you call serious case of depression, which I suffered for um, for decades. I don't have it now. For the last 30 years, I don't have it. But I, I really had to work on to, to try to get over it, which, I've, you know, it wasn't a organic, chemical kind of stuff. It was just based on you know, whatever was happening. So I realized I had to do something, and I, but I didn't quite know what was I was suffering from these depressions. So I would go to the, so I, I, I latched on to reading and going to doing things like reading uh, novels and poetry and other stuff and listening to the BBC, you know, serious stuff. I became very serious. And here in school I was doing pretty awfully, but there I was beginning to read. I started to read Freud and, and I started to, uh, I read Dale Carnegie, How to Make Friends and Influence People, uh, and I would take the lesson and say, you know, ten lessons how to do this, and five. Uh, and, and, and another book I read was Life Begins at Forty. I would tell myself, I don't care how long it takes. If it even takes me, you know, these American self-help books, which the GIs brought them over. The GIs brought over in the Second World War. They had these. The, the armed services had these uh, <laughs> hundreds of titles, and the GIs, Jewish GIs, would come to the Jewish hostel for the occasions, and they would bring all these books, and I would snap them up. American history, novels, bestsellers, poets. And the, of course, the, the, and the library, the uh, the, um, the Carnegie libraries, which were public libraries, you know, Northampton had a very good library, do, uh, endowed by Dale, by Carnegie, not the Dale Carnegie, the other Carnegie, Carnegie and, and free. And so I would, I was, I was a big, big, all the children's classics, you know, Dumas, and all down down the line, as well as very serious stuff. So. Uh, this was at the age of about 14 and 15, I would, and then I would walk in the, in the, in, in the, in, it was very quick to get from where you were into the countryside, and you didn't have, in England, the signs that keep out private property, it was kind of common property. In America, of course, wherever you went, you see private property, uh, trespassers would be shot on sight, is the kind of thing I saw in California. And, <laughs> Did you stay? You stayed in the orphanage and then went to school. Well, I went in this hostel. Yeah, we 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 we, we uh, stayed in the orphanage. It was at a religious orphanage, which meant we had four, uh, the man who was in charge was had been the director of the orphanage, Jewish Orthodox Jewish uh, orphanage in Frankfurt am Main, which was a, the epicenter, the big center of German Jewish Orthodoxy, and a, a sort of modern Jewish. Sure. You could do, you could be religious, fully religious, but you could also be modern. You didn't have to sort of stay out, you know, like the Hasidic Jews very often don't want to do with modernity. You know, they think it's, it's a bad thing. To, it's going to corrupt. It's going to lead to all kinds of, which sometimes often it does, but it's another story. So 
uh, you know, and, and so that's what basically I think saved me. And also the will to try to get better, you know, where I would talk to myself when I would walk, and I would read Wordsworth and memorize Wordsworth and uh, I wandered lonely as a cloud and all that stuff. You know, I love that. I love uh, the poetry. You're good in the English lit courses. <laughs> yeah. Although the worst course I ever took was at San Francisco State College where this old lady was teaching uh, romantic, English romantic literature. San Francisco State College, that was another interesting story. And it was so, and there were only three of us in the course, and now I know why. And I couldn't doze off. You know, this, it, means it was so boring. You know how sometimes you greet somebody and, and whatever, it, I don't know what it is, it triggers off an, ins, an instinctive reaction to want to drop off and fall asleep. And so I went through this whole semester. I couldn't really fall. It was tor like Chinese torture. And that was with the stuff that I really liked. <laughs> anyway, that's so, how um, I managed to, you know, to finish and then I was apprenticed. Uh, so I went to my, uh, to my uh, oh, you, guardian. Uh, this uh, Mr. Marx, who was the head of the orphanage, but also the head of this of this uh, hostel. After I finished, and I said, and, and yeah, the question was, high, we high school, sorry. yeah, I finished high, I finished the technical high school, and uh, he we talked about it, and I said, I uh, what I wanted to be is a teacher. Was I saw the reason I want to be a teacher is I want to have an impact, and second of all, I realized what a bad job he was doing, uh, because I realized he, this man was well intentioned. But he didn't have a clue about the mentality of of, of, of children, of boys, and, and I had read John Dewey around that time. You know, I was aware of the American John Dewey and Counts and others who were into this. You know, mobilize the children's energies, get them involved, make them independent. You know, get, give them some real responsibilities, and they'll measure up. And so I was very. And I, this guy was creating. You know, he meant well, he did okay in feeding us, but he had no clue about, and then he did some other stupid things later on when some, some of the children came over from the camps, some of these survivors from the death camps came over about 20 years after the war. And so I, I wanted to be a teacher. Well, when I went to him and said I wanted to be a teacher, he said, he wasn't being malicious, he just sort of said basically, you know, you're not smart enough. So uh, I said to myself, oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't tell him that. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, I'll show you. So my re the story is the rest of my life was just to show Mr. Marx that he was wrong. Let's see. So um, he apprenticed me to an accountant auditor in town. Uh, and that meant in those days, being like Charles Dickens, you were sitting on a stool with your visor, and you were doing it all by hand. So for s four days of the week, that's what I was doing, oh, and I, you know, I was doing it pretty well, I guess, and I can still add up large amounts of figures. But it wasn't my cup of tea. But once a week, I would go out with a bicycle into. He was an, a, an auditor who was responsible for collecting rents for some of the uh, tenants of working class districts. So I would go around in in Northampton collecting rents uh, amongst the very poor and. And this was kind of, you know, sociologically. This is now after the war, right? Yeah, the it was over. very interesting. I mean, I, I found it interesting. Because um, you interacted with people. Yeah, and it, it, is, it uh, made you think about, you know, poverty and, and, right. and different cultures and so on and so forth. So I rather liked that. Uh, and then uh, the question came up, well, I, I didn't want to be an, an accountant. You were apprenticed in those days, which meant you'd have to spend seven or eight years this and, and who knows what, and it just wasn't what I wanted to do. So I had two choices, actually. I could have, I had become very interested. In, in this hostel where we were, there was also a religious um, uh, movement, uh, sort of like a scout movement, from the Zionist movement to religious Zionism, B'nai Akiba, and, and I was a, part, a member of that. And I was really attracted to the experiments that the Zionist movement was doing to in the kibbutz, you know, the kibbutz, the kibbutz movement. And I, I, you know, philosophically and ideologically, I was really attracted to that kind of movement. But I knew, so I could, I could have, and, and quite a number of, of those of us who were in uh, the refugee children went eventually to Palestine and Israel. But, and so for me, I could have, I could have gone that way. Or the other option was my, an uncle and aunt of mine in California, in Oakland, knew I was here and they 
they got in touch with me. New and room, here me in London. Uh, yeah, in mm -hmm. Northampton, mm -hmm. and said, did, you, did I want to come over? So I said, yeah, yeah, of course, because I wanted to be a teacher. And also I had, you know, I had to wear the National Geographic. <laughs> but, you know, Good they brought over the National Geographic, and, and you, you know, Americans. Takes your breath away to yeah, get pictures. Does. I remember <laughs> the picture, one picture that, that haunted me was the picture of Daffodil, that wandered lonely as a cloud, you know. And there was this picture in the National Geographic of a field of daffodils in California that went for miles, uh, you know. I said, wow, wow, this is great. So I looked for that field of daffodils in California for years. I could never find it. Uh, and this is where all I found was these signs saying trespassers, <laughs> shot, or whatever it was. Um, so I was, you know, I was attracted to American history. I read a lot about American history, about you know, uh, Jefferson and Washington and slavery and, you know, it was uh, interesting. I was very attracted to the, you know, I was very in, uh, temperamentally a, demo, you know, a Democrat with a small D, if you know what I mean. Right. So I was very uh, attracted to that. So when they said, do you want to come to uh, America, I said yes. And they arranged it uh, very quickly because they had a... Uh, somebody that they knew, not exactly a friend, my aunt had been employed by a Baptist minister uh, when, she, when they first came to this country, uh, as a, maybe a housemaid or something, I don't know exactly what, and this man was uh, Dr. Mitchell, he was um, uh, the vice chair of the National Council of Christians and Jews, and he was a you know, kind of influential person, and he went over to England, and he talked to, talked to me, and and then he went to the American consulate, and he arranged. I was on, ironically, I was on the German quota. I mean, they had deprived me of my German citizenship when I left, but the Americans didn't care, you know, what the National Socialists did. I was still technically speaking a German citizen. So on the German, the German quota was very easy because the, the, the um, act of 1925 or 26 had made it very difficult for East Europeans and people from you know, from undesirable so-called racial stocks from Greece and wherever else to come over, but the, these you know, Anglo-Saxon stocks, oh, that was good. And so uh, he was able to arrange so that I, I, as a matter of fact, and Mr. Marx and his family, because Mr. Marx then sort of latched on to him. And I was, I was over uh, probably within three months. And so in November, I think it was 1946, I came over to the United States. And... Um, let me inter let me ask you a question. What happened? To, did any con did you ever make any contact with your parents? Did well, you my my parents them? my parents were evacuated. Did they know that that you didn't reach England? No. Yes, I did that because it was still possible uh, to uh, to correspond until oh. the war broke out. Okay. So I had left in in uh, December 1938. War didn't break out until September, I believe. Was right. it August, I'm not sure. 1940. Uh, 40, 1939. So they were able to write to me and say, you know, be good and do well, and, blah, 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 and I was able to write to them. And then once the war, once the war broke out, it was still possible to sort of indirectly do it through the Red Cross, I think. And then they were, all the Jews in southern Germany in 1940, end of 1940, my father, uh, they, they were all deported, all expelled en masse on some day in late uh, somewhere, I think it was November 1940, uh, to Camp de Gers, which was in southern France, which had been a internment camp for, for the, those who had fled uh, after the S Spanish Civil War ended and the, the Republicans were defeated. And then it had been abandoned or there had been whatever it was. And then so there was this really miserable place, uh, but it was not a, a concentration camp and it was not a, 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 a death camp. It was, it was just an old camp, camp that been a camp in bad shape, uh, and so uh, my parents and Eric and uh, and ten thousand others I don't know how many exactly were all sent there, and then uh, my father died there. Well, the conditions were bad. Elderly people tended to kind of not, you know, die um, earlier than they probably would otherwise have died, uh, but that was not because it was you know that it was deliberate or anything. It was just. Bad. He, you said he hadn't been well. No, he. So he. I think well. all his life he had been kind of sickly, actually. So I don't want to blame it. You know, it was just uh, the trauma of being. <laughs> yeah, and, and everything else. So he uh, died, and uh, and he was buried there. And I have, as a matter of fact, a cousin of mine went there about ten years ago, took a photo of. I didn't know he was buried there, 
he, and there's a photo, you know, in very simple that people who died were buried, and their, their, their cemetery is still there. Uh, so, and then uh, subsequently, uh, maybe uh, six months later, the Vichy government, together with the Germans, uh, shipped, sent all of the people in those camps uh, to Auschwitz, and so, so that's where they all were all murdered, or I don't know how many survived, but most of them didn't. And that was that included my mother. Now, Eric, in the, in the meantime, that was your foster. Yeah, you know, okay. he had been smuggled out, and he was uh, uh, hidden by some nuns. So he survived the war, uh, and he's now a French. He's now as French as you can get, with his beret and three French children, and doesn't speak any German. At least he, he also has. It was very traumatic for him. Uh, so he doesn't remember. He says he doesn't remember any German, although I suspect. It, you know, it, it, maybe it's too painful for him to yeah, bring it back. Yeah. Because not speaking German, that's what his life depended on. What? Not speaking German while he was there in France, what will his life depended on? If, they, if he was found out, that would have been, been bad for him as well as for those who, who took the trouble to save him. I understand. So, so that's what happened. And um, so I went to California and um, was uh, then missed, uh, uh, Dr. Mitchell took me to, I had an option to there, I could have gone to University of California in Berkeley, or I could have gone to San Francisco State Teachers College, which is now San Francisco State University, and a very big one, and a fairly good one too. But it was not quite good then too, I thought. It was a teacher's college, 600 students. I don't know whether you've been to San Francisco or not. Uh, I've Herman not seen street. that school, but I've been to San Francisco. Yeah, there's Herman Street and the Main Street. At the end of it, there was this, you know, very simple, with a lot of quantum huts and gardens, what else. It was a small school, a teacher's college, and um, uh, I, I wanted to be a teacher, so, and, and I was uh, very shy. I was pathologically, you know, pathologically is perhaps too strong. I was really shy. You know, if you knew how shy I was, you would not believe it when you see me at work today. I mean, talk about transformations. So, uh, they do come around. <laughs> yeah. I, so I, I, uh, I. Did you live at home and lived at? Then with my uncle and aunt, which was okay. not a really a terribly great thing to do. They were good people, but. Uh, Did they have any children? No, oh. they had. Uh, they, one problem was that my aunt, who couldn't have any children, wanted children, tried in a series of ways to get my, first my older cousin of mine, who was older than I am, and his sister, and they didn't want to come, and then I was the third one. <laughs> so. I was supposed to be a surrogate son, I think, and it didn't quite work. Uh, she wanted me to change my name to the name of my uncle, Seckles, and I didn't see why I should change my name. You know, thing. I mean, they were good people, but uh, they were very narrow and limited. My uncle, in particular, my nuisance by my religion. So, and they had a a. a, a Grandmother, uh, my aunt's mother was there, and she was suffering with dementia. So, uh, you know, and I had to kind of smile and be you know, nice and whatnot. It was not, and I was very shy and, and depressed, so it was not uh, ideal, but hey, I survived. And then when I went to San Francisco State with uh, Dr. Mitchell, there was a the man who was the president, what was his name? I, I, he, he interviewed me. He, he went to his office and he talked to me for the 10 president minutes. president of San Francisco. State. Uh -huh. He was a very interesting guy. He, he was, and he in, talked to me for 10 minutes and saw that I was a serious young man. I could speak English and I was motivated and he says, you win. That was it. Because in those days in, San, in California, all over, uh, if you qualified to go and were admitted to the university, you didn't have to pay any tuition. So all I had to pay was uh, probably five dollar fee for maybe the gym fee or something. That was it. No books. You got your books. Too? The books you had to know. Yeah, those <laughs> you those you had to get. Yes. But uh, that that was not a big deal. Sure. And so uh, I got a totally f free education. And, and all four years. All four years, and plus uh, another year to get a general secondary credential, which. Um, and I was a good. I was really a good student. At that point, I was really a good student, uh, and, and I was doing well, uh, mostly A's and B's. Uh, some courses, maybe a C, one or two C's, perhaps in astronomy or something. I don't know what. 
whatever it was. But I really was, uh, I think, a fairly good student. And I was really in in intellectually interested. I really loved this stuff. And I worked part-time. And you had enriched your background because of all the additional readings that you had done. That's right. You brought a lot to and the And I was table. motivated. And, right. and, and I had, I was also working. I worked part, I had a half-time job. Um, that was another, I don't want to tell you the story of my life here, but how I got to, to that point. But uh, my actually had also made it clear, they were always afraid. You know, Germans sometimes tend to be afraid if you give somebody a little finger, they'll take the whole hand. That's the mentality. And they were afraid I might abuse, you know. It wasn't even very clear to me. I barely set foot in the house when my uncle gave me a little lecture, you know, basically. Well, you know, we're very glad to have you, but, you know, uh, and, you know just like I picked up with, with in Germany, they uh, you know, picked up things. I picked that up very quickly, you know, that they're afraid that I'll just load, load around and take advantage of them, which I, was not my intention, certainly. But I was also not a, an American kid, used to, you know, I was, and so I had a need to get a job of some sort, and in those days it was easier, but I was very shy. I was fearful of rejection, it was a problem of my life. I was afraid of being rejected. So it took me a while uh, to, I finally found a job in a cannery. Um, you know, I had, to, I had to suffer through rejections and through bouts of depression and everything else, but I had to, I always realized up here I have to keep on going mm -hmm. because you know, and I had to also seek out help, which I did. I would, uh, eventually, I you know went to psychologists and psychiatrists and psychoanalysts and what have you to try to get some help. Yeah. What about when did you get your citizenship? How did that come about? I got that pretty soon. Oh. I think I got that five or six years after, after you came. You know, when I you got were it fairly quickly. I also. Uh, that's, when was this? When was the coup? 1951. I, 51, yeah, I was in the California National Guard. Somehow or other, I got in the California National Guard. And oh, I'll tell you, I, I used to say, now I know Russia's secret weapon. It's the National Guard. <laughs> but so you did have military, so you didn't, but you didn't. No, no, that. but I, I got out eventually. Oh. And I, but then I went to New York because I got my teaching credential, but I. Psychologically, I wasn't ready for it. I knew that. I went all the way to Oregon with all my books and everything. And then, just before I started to teach in a small rural area, I had to tell the principal, "Look, I, I really am not. Uh, I, I really can't go through." I mean, I was too anxious, too depressed. So I needed to find myself. And how do you find yourself? You go to New York. So I went to my uncle, and my uncle was always living through me. He was a very lim no, not a, not a bad man, but he was very extremely limited. And all he lived for me. All the, the first thing you want to know, did you get an A? Did you get an A? I said, getting an A is not the important thing. Uh, you know, the important thing is to learn. But yeah, I did get an A. You know, but that's not the important thing. And then he wanted me, you know, when I came back, to him, when I, he said, you have to go and get another job. I said, no, I'm not getting another job. You can kick me out, but I'm not getting another job. So I went to the cannery in the one before, and I worked there for about 12 weeks, 12 hours a day, seven hours, seven days a week, overtime and everything. So I, you know, to get a little money so I wouldn't starve when I got to New York because I was always afraid I, you know, the worth would swallow me up. And, and so I went to New York and uh, uh, shortly after that and went to the Y, and there was a big Y there in New York, and stayed there two or three, a couple of days, looked in a newspaper, a German-Jewish newspaper, for a room and found a room. It, it, it really it didn't take much time. And, I found, and then I looked again and I found a, uh, in New York, whatever the newspaper was, and found there was, oh, they want somebody in the New York Times in the radio station for their office. So I w interviewed there and I got the job uh, as a clerk, you know. For the, and so I had to, so I was settled. But I wasn't being teaching. I wasn't teaching. So then I went and got up. <coughs> I decided. I had, well, I so I actually got an MA at um, a branch of Columbia University with a major. Actually, it was Teachers College, which is public. And uh, got a, an MA in that. And in the meantime, I was taking. One of the things I did was I knew I needed some help to help myself. I knew uh, reading. Dale Carnegie and all the self-help books weren't enough. So I, uh, being smart as I am, I uh, decided what's the way to get psychological help quickly. So I called up some 
place that's a clinic or whatever it was. I said, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to help immediately. So they got me somebody. <laughs> and this was a Dr. Alfred Joyce. He had just come out of the army. He was a psychoanalyst. And um, so you lie flat, you know, on the couch, and you have to, you know, find a dream. Once you uh, need a dream, you can always bring up dreams. And I thought it was kind of interesting, you know. I was, I knew quite a bit about uh, psychoanalysis. I'd read about Freud. And all that. Uh, it was very helpful in many ways, but not because of the dream interpretation, uh, but because two things. One, one thing this uh, uh, Dr. Joy, Dr. Alfred Joyce said to me was, you know, Joe, you can lie here on this couch forever and a day, basically, basically. You can lie here on this couch forever and a day, and we can get all the insights, whatever, but unless you go and do something and put them into practice or whatever it is, means unless you venture forth in a way, this won't do you any good. So, and then I went, then he put me after a year or so into a group, group session, rather than coming to him individually, that he, le that he was in charge of. And then they were also saying, you know, I, from there, from the New York Times, I went to, I left, that was a dead end job, you know, clerical, addressograph and stuff, it wasn't very challenging or anything. Uh, and it was minimum wage to begin with. But it was the New York Times, WQXR was the radio station. So I, um, I went to the welfare, I, got a, I left it and I went to the welfare department as a social investigator, which uh, was a, again an interesting job, really interesting. Uh, but it was at an end also because the people, you know, there was a mixed, uh, uh, a mixed, group, a mixed caseload, uh, the center was in Harlem, and you'd go and get all kinds, and you really could make a difference. And so, just to show you, uh, I guess, how my mind worked, I went in there, and these, these welfare centers, this was back in 1950, maybe 1955 or so. New York had a very liberal uh, welfare program, actually. Um, very good, I think very good for its time. But the caseloads, the, the centers were, were, were chaos. The people were having nervous breakdowns because there were, there, there were lots of things, caseload centers. If you don't do something, they tend to load up and pressure. So I looked around and I made, said a couple of things to myself. One thing, is, I, one thing I said, I, I'm not responsible for the messes, you know, the, the, the poverty and the, uh, the way people are being neglected and maybe the injustice towards the poor that systemically don't occur. It's not my, it's not my I'm not responsible for that. All I can try to do is to do this job as best as I can, and from eight to five, and then forget about it, you know, because that's, and I'm not here to fix people up, you know, psychologically. It's not my job to be a, 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 a social worker. So I'm here to make sure that the people who are, are on public assistance get what they're entitled to, make sure that they're eligible if they're eligible, and then if they're eligible, thank God, they should get what they're eligible. And, and not to impose my middle class values on them. You know, you're entitled to it, you're gonna get it. And uh, so what I did was, I would go in, it's a couple of things, very simple. I would go in, you know, you, you'd go, you'd have, let, maybe I had 110, you'd go in, you had some cases that you investigated the, from the beginning, and most of them were ongoing cases. So you'd go in, you'd investigate, you may wanna make sure that they were really eligible, and then I would, you know, you dictate, meaning that you go, I would immediately dictate the cases when I got back to the case, to the welfare center, and then I would immediately write out whatever they were entitled to. You know, because you had, you had uh, women mothers who needed something for their children for school, or they needed something here, or they needed this or that or the other, and so I come home. First thing I did was to send it out so they would get it quickly. And the second thing I did was when they would come in for some problem, I would not keep them waiting around. I would make sure that uh, as soon as they came in, I would say, well, I'll see you as soon as I, you know, very soon. Because I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't want them to, uh, I felt if I was here, I didn't want to be left hanging around. Mm -hmm. And so if you treat people with, uh, you know, with a certain amount of dignity, whatever it else you want to call it, um, that was the second thing. Just And the third thing was uh, for those no, oh, I love this because uh, there were fathers of, of you know, children. Uh, if they, if the fathers could not support the children, fine. But if they had any, if they could support, I would hunt them down. 
And, you know, I, I became quite good at it. And I would get them to court and to make them pay because I thought, well, you know, uh, fair is fair. But I wasn't going to peek under the bed to see whether some man was around because, hey, the, the laws are written in such a way very often to get families apart rather than join them, you know. the way. Through. So that was not my job. And so, but the problem with the job, so you could do is make, and, and the other thing I loved was when you get some of the old elderly people, uh, you know, they, they would think, uh, you know, they were so grateful and, 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 and so dividend about it. I would say, look, you're entitled to, you're entitled to this. this. The Congress, and they said, what, what is it? Do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have? You know, I would give them what they needed uh, and try to assure them that this was not some handout. This is what they were entitled to. And, and the result of all of this, I'm not bragging here, you know, it just seemed obvious to me. The result of it all was, after six months or so, my caseload was humming. There was, you know, there were no problems. Uh, occasionally, then you had a problem. You had some serious case of neglect or something else. Then you could do something or housing problems. You could then go and try to fix something up if you, you know, or find somebody who fix things up. But how many people were collapsing from this? And I was having, you know, you handled it very well. You know, that's sort of the way I. <laughs> that's I, my life, right? <laughs> yeah. But then it, the problem with it was. It was a dead end because most of the supervisors, in the, you know, we had a, uh, supervisors and and most of them were at this point were these Jewish uh, uh, graduates of City College or someplace who had graduated at the height of the depression, and they had been traumatized because they couldn't find a job, and finally they got a job in in this organization, and it was so traumatic for them that they couldn't, they were also operating beneath their abilities, I thought. So they, um, they were going to be there for another 20 years. And so finally I decided, uh, and in, in this um, counseling, people were saying to me, you know, you're really, a, you're really, you're so intellectual, you know, you know you're blah, 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 you really ought to try more. And so I finally said, okay, I'll go back and, and, and try to get a PhD. And that's when I went back to Berkeley to Again, very, uh, oh God, it was not easy. Uh, you know, there were lots of all kinds of problems, but uh, because I, f I realized, uh, you know, you, you, you have to take a chance, you have to be willing to fail, you have to, you have to just keep going, uh, otherwise you stagnate, and, and, that's, uh, and that's been sort of my... What did you, you get your PhD in? in Political in science. Okay. I had... And, and what and prompted, uh, had you had some interest in that? Or? Well, I was interested in my main I think has always been trying to make some difference. It doesn't have to be global, but I wanted to have some impact. I saw the university in a way, or teaching, as a way of partly what interested me was, but political science, I, I was interested in history, but history seemed a little more dis, uh, di, uh, distant from trying to do something. Political science seems to be a little bit more focused on the world and trying to change it for the better in a way. Uh, although that's, I've changed my mind on that to some extent. Um, so I went to Berkeley and, and um, and also, you know, what I, um, I like the intellectual pursuit in itself. I, I think knowledge doesn't always have to be um, instrumental. It does, you know, there's a, like, just like music, there's an intrinsic worthwhileness to it. You do it because it's exciting or because it deepens your understanding of the world you live in or whatever else. And it's just a, an intrinsic good. Uh, and I also like the idea of an in, a community of scholars. Uh, one thing was the intellectual life of people sharing certain things and working to get better understanding or whatever else is involved. And that's what I thought the university was about. And uh, the other thing was mentoring. I, you know, I saw a film in England called Goodbye, Mr. Chips. I don't know whether you ever saw that film or not. A long time ago, probably before your time. And so I also like the idea of mentoring. Of I thought the important thing in education is the, um, the human, you know, really, education isn't training. You know, I think a lot of education today is basically training. We call it education, but it's really training. Yeah. Uh, and education is more than training. Well, we all need training, of course, but... Um, and so education and learning and mentoring, making a difference, uh, interacting with students and, and developing some relationships and, and trying to, 
you know, to set a model in some ways, perhaps. That's what answered. Well, of course, the community of scholar as well as mentoring didn't turn out that way uh, ultimately. And, uh, it turned out that way to some extent in Jewish studies, but certainly not in political science, okay. where, you know, which is another story. Um, after you got your PhD, did, was, what was your career path before you came to Purdue? Did you come to Purdue? Yeah, I, I, I got it at my first, well, I got my PhD and then I was an instructor in Berkeley for uh, I think a year or two. Uh -huh. After you got it. Yeah, and then I got a job at Rutgers. And now my main area at that point I think was really political philosophy rather than what I eventually ended up. My area of research had been the relationship between science and politics. I was interested in the, in the larger sense of the word, in the politics of science as a human enterprise. And I had done a, that's what I had done my work on. Uh, so I was, it, it was not just, you know, public policy. It was a very broad kind of uh, thing. And I'd written, I'd done some case studies in that, and that's what I, my, dissertation and book uh, eventually turned out to be. And uh, uh, at Rutgers, well, so I was at Rutgers, uh, and uh, was it a good, was a good place, but that didn't turn out eventually, at least, I, for whatever reason. So I got a job here at Purdue. Okay. I was looking around, uh, and there was here, uh, political science had been, I don't know, you may have been here at the time, Political science in its earlier manifestations had been a very conflict-ridden department. I don't know, you may, you may have been here. Uh, I came, uh, the person who hired me was actually, uh, what's his name, Hale, uh, I forget his first name. He was the head, Hale, his last name was. Uh, I'll remember and it'll come back to me. And he hired me, because what had happened is, when at Purdue, as I heard it, at least this is, I wasn't here when it happened, when Purdue became a broader kind of institution from, you know, from a fairly, from a more technical university to a broader all around university, and when these service departments were broken up, political science, they had to kind of define themselves what you want to do. And, he, and, and political science at that point, early on, decided that they wanted to uh, f focus their department and give it an imprint on science, technology, and public policy. So they hired about seven or eight people who were doing science, technology, and public policy in various manifestations. And as I understand it, I, I uh, came in at, after a year. The year that I came, it was the year when I think of the eight or if it was seven or seven people left in one year. There had been a big fight in the department, I think, about defining the department. And some felt this was kind of an imperialistic enterprise. You know, science technology was swallowing up the whole department. And I didn't think, subsequently I wasn't involved in this, that it had to be, you can teach anything on the science technology about the department. You can teach ancient, you know, you can. But there was a fight, and so um, most people left. And so I was hired after uh, the people had left? Yes, I, and uh, in, uh, to head up, first to become a director, I didn't want to be a director because I was still very nervous, so I was heading up the program. And I hired uh, three... One. In political science? Yes, okay. I think four people. Um, two, a female, and... No, three. Three. So we had, we had one, two, we had uh, four, five, six people. And I was heading it, sort of heading it, not in no formal title. And uh, that's uh, sort of, this was under Hen, uh, Myron Hale, his name was. You may remember Myron Hale. Yeah, I do. Uh, I remember the name. Nice guy, but not too swift when he went to the department, I'll tell you. Uh, but, uh, so it was a very, very protracted and bitter fight to get rid of Myron Hale that I came right in. It was like, it was like the Viet Vietnam War, it was, it was pretty awful, I mean, uh, on both sides, I thought. Uh, and eventually the, he was pushed out and uh, it left a lot of ill will and it was very, uh, because Myron Hale was a nice guy, you know, he, 
but he wasn't too. I didn't think he was smart. Uh, he, you know, it's because of a little things. You had, there was no real huge issue here anymore. It was over little things that escalated into big things. You know how it goes. All of a sudden, everybody's up in arms because this and that. I thought it was quite. Well, not a lot of yeah, so that's what I came in here. Uh, that's that's how I came to to here. And then I tried to broaden the bridges. I uh, again, I, I liked it. I I always thought that the real world is interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. It isn't as narrow. So I was very interested in this whole area of. of you know, the politics of science and science thing, that was it, of broadening it. So I started out this noon series, uh, amongst other things, um, to try to engage people in political science with other people in, in engineering and this, and to, you know, to... Broaden the whole yeah. perspective, right. And that worked uh, pretty well, I, I think, and I started some other little publication, and, and this and that and the other, to try to... Uh, to do some of this and build a, you know, community is the thing I'm always interested in, building community, because I lack, you know, you always do the things you lack. The, you know, I always like to say, the Greeks, who, whose idea was harmony, right? The golden mean, the Greeks were the most intemperate people around. You haven't seen anybody, isn't. so they focused on the thing they lacked the most and they needed the most, which was temperance. So in my case, I've always been f interested in community and building community because that's what I lacked. So I think this is where we'll stop and okay. we'll pick up on the Jewish studies. Right. Does that sound good? Okay. Let's end it. Part one.